Hello, it's a pleasure to be here at TEDx Carbon Park and address you all. My name is Pranoy Tapaya. I'm 26 years old and I live and work at this incredible ecosystem that is called Kere Haklu. This one, in fact. Kere Haklu is a four and a half hour drive from the city of Bangalore in South India. And like the four generations before me, I've had the pleasure of overseeing, learning from and giving back to this incredible piece of land that has given us so much. The photograph over here is of a 400 year old fig tree that is at the heart of Kere Haklu. Um, it towers over all the other trees in our canopy. The bushes that surround it, as some of you might have guessed already, are coffee bushes and we are producers of Indian coffee. The beauty of how we grow coffee in India is that it grows alongside and under the shade of various different trees, creating a biodiversity hotspot. To add to this all, we actually share two of our major boundaries with the reserve forest. And for this reason, we have to interact with an influx of the local fauna for 12 months in the year. And um, the photograph over here is of a massive adult male Indian gore, also known as the bison. And the reason you can tell it's an adult male, in fact, is because of the hump on its shoulders or its back, which, which they only get when they reach maturity. And um, currently we actually think, or we suspect that we have a herd of 25 to 27 bison living within our boundaries. And, we interact with them every other day and coexist with them to the best of our abilities. Right here now, I'd like to address two things. What does Kere Haklu mean and what, what is it really? Um, what it means um, is quite interesting. The word itself is a bit complicated, but if you break it down, it's actually fairly simple. Kere is a, a lake or a large body of water in the regional language of Canada, of the area. And um, Haklu is an ancient Kannada word that's not really used so much anymore. And it means a shelter or a hut. And so directly translates to the shelter by the lake. And um, what is Kere Haklu? That is a million dollar question. And one I, I find asking myself on, on the daily almost. And um, the word farm, the word estate, the word plantation, they're all used to describe Kere Haklu, and I would say they're fairly applicable in several senses, but I'd like to look at Kere Haklu as an ecosystem. And the more I look at it and analyze it, I actually look at it as overlapping ecosystems with unique microclimatic conditions, and it's helped pave the way um, to how I lead life over here. And so today I'm here to talk about Kere Haklu as an ecosystem where my family and I live. I've been involved for three and a half years, and in this time, I've been able to successfully build a transparent farm to table community. This over here was taken in 2019 and um, was a stall I had at, at a farmer's market in Bangalore. At the same time, I've been able to elevate produce that is otherwise undervalued or overlooked and take it to the kitchens of some of the top chefs in the country while also working alongside some of the best Indian specialty roasters and provide them with our specialty coffee, which has been an honor to say the least. Also, what I've been involved with is modernizing and digitizing several bits of wisdom and several procedures that have been handed down from generation to generation. And this photograph is a very special one for me and my family. And um, it's of a ledger that contains daily, ra daily rainfall records from the 1st of January, 1954. And so it's provided us with a huge sample size of data that I'm actually currently digitizing and hoping to analyze statistically to, statistically to sort of draw correlations from and conclude from in the next few months. And that's what I'm here to talk about today, Kere Haklu as an ecosystem. I've divided the short talk into three parts. First up is flora. The photograph over here is of a block called Mavinahati, and it's probably my favorite block. It's the most diverse, the most noisy in a very good way. And yesterday I went for a walk over to check on the work and um, I actually heard and saw five or six gray hornbills sitting in the canopy and almost cackling at me, which is a unique experience. 
And um, this block contains some of our healthiest Arabica coffee and also our avocados, jackfruit, um, pomelos and oranges. And the next photograph is of this monster avocado we harvested in 2018 from this very same block and it actually weighed in at over one kilo. It's something my family is incredibly proud of to be able to grow these huge avocados which actually taste just as good as they look. But right here, I'd like to stop and acknowledge something that um, coffee and avocados, both the crops I've just talked about, are actually not native to India. And it's extremely important to keep that in mind. They're both two species or actually groups of species that have been introduced to India over different centuries and naturalized in several senses to our climatic, soil and even microclimatic conditions. I, I've been recently looking at the Indian cuisine or cuisines rather because there's so many and it's when we think of Indian food we think of spices and what's actually quite unique is that um, chilies which are a central ingredient to um, a lot of dishes for breakfast, lunch and dinner are not actually native to India. They were introduced um, a couple hundred years ago and have again naturalized to different climatic conditions and now are a central ingredient to a lot of dishes from not, not to south, east to west. And it's, it's special because I'd like to think um, there's similar parallels with coffee in South India in particular where our palates and our diets are used to coffee and having a couple of cups every single day. Next up is a photo of something that is actually native and we actually grow a lot of and it's green peppercorns. And um, this is something that we actually, if you actually even look at old Mughal scriptures, they actually refer to green peppercorns and black peppercorns when they're dried. And this is something we actually grow a lot of. And recently we've been having issues with the porcupine and we find that the porcupine love actually biting the stems or the vines of the actual pepper vine. And um, because it has a saline like solution. And so it's something that we're currently dealing with. Next up, and it leads me to the second part of this talk, which is fauna. And this over here is a beautiful animal called um, the monitor lizard. And we call it Uda in Canada. I've only seen a monitor maybe three times in all my years over here. And um, this guy was about four and a half feet high, four and a half feet long. And so these guys are actually able to scale a tree 30, 35 feet high in a matter of seconds. And it's a sight to see. And our dogs are often left just barking at them from ground level. And so we encounter such animals and it's, it's special to share spaces and coexist with them. And next up is one of the busier and noisier animals, which I actually can see from out my window sometimes. And it's called a giant Malabar squirrel. It's actually about this big, the size of a dog. And it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's bronze and copper colored. And um, we actually spotted two, my dad spotted two of them about 10 years ago. But now we suspect we have a very healthy and thriving population of anywhere between 15 and 20 giant Malabar squirrels. And these are magnificent creatures that feed on our figs, our mulberries, and we're happy to share a lot of our resources with because they absolutely mean no harm to any of us. Last but not least is the elephant. And this massive elephant we finally photographed after several different attempts um, by my dad in particular. Um, this guy we suspect is the same adolescent male elephant that's been visiting us for a few years now. And so he comes in at um, just during the dark. He never travels in the day and he follows the same path and he devours the same jackfruit and the same coconut. And we're very happy to compromise on them. We are more than okay compromising or sacrificing these um, certain crops for the animals of the era, particularly el the elephants, because we believe that um, they are not just co-inhabitants, but also the rightful owners of the land. And so it's something that we account for every single year and we're more than okay with. Category three, and it might raise some eyebrows, it is fungi. Um, I chose this because it is a separate category and a separate kingdom actually, genetically, 
um, to us animals, but it is the kingdom that we are most closely related to, which is which I find very interesting. And it's the reason why several antibiotics like penicillin, which is the most commonly used antibiotic in the world, is actually derived from a fungus. And so this alien like um, fungi over here is called the bridal veil mushroom or the veil lady mushroom. And we've only ever seen it twice. And um, it's a very unique looking fungi that um, is actually the net like structure is actually edible. And if you look closely, you can actually see a few slugs and the slugs over there actually devour the net like structure in about 10 or 12 minutes. And so next up is a fungus called the dead, dead man's fingers. And as the name suggests, they actually look like fingers. And so um, we have found that fungi in several senses are indicators of improving ecosystem health. And we have found that we leave like the fig tree that I showed you before. Um, we've decided to let a lot of the trees to decay when they fall. And that's because um, they actually help the flush of fungi. And so decomposing of wood and organic matter through fungi is something that we find is really helping Kerehaklu as an ecosystem because we're seeing more and more varieties and species of fungi that we've never seen before. And it also has to do a lot with um, the lack of chemicals. And it's something we're incredibly proud of. So yeah, um, that is about it for me over here. And um, I just wanted to tell you a bit about our life at Kerry Haklu and the life that my family has been leading for several different decades now. And um, I just wanted to say that it is very much possible to coexist and live in harmony with um, the local biodiversity and also be agriculturists. We're in a world now where things are getting worse and worse, um, where animals and birds are losing their territories and we're often found sharing spaces. And I'd just like to finish with this photograph um, of the Kere Haklu Kere or the Kere Haklu Lake. And um, it is in a deeper part of Kere Haklu again. And some literature actually suggests that the name dates back to the 12th century where we actually have a fort about three kilometers away and the same literature suggests that it was actually used as a drinking water source by inhabitants of this fort. And um, yeah, thank you for having me.